How wonderful it is to be back here with our church family and to be standing in the pulpit again and to see your wonderful faces. And it's a blessing on this beautiful day uh, to be back together uh, for worship. I want you to imagine that you're serving on a search committee for a pastor or a ministry director, or really it could be anybody in a position of influence or responsibility. And a member of the search committee <clears throat> reports on a resume that's been received. This member was assigned the task of checking references, uh, presenting the facts of the resume, the biographical statement, and a telephone interview. And so imagine that his report goes like this. Well, this candidate uh, has spent most of the time traveling around preaching to whoever would listen, uh, doesn't have a real permanent address, jailed on a number of occasions, in frequent trouble with local authorities, sometimes barely escaping capture, uh, fleeing in the middle of the night, involved in a number of public squabbles, accused of being anti-authority, causing disturbances, interrupting local commerce, uh, even starting a riot, has frequent health issues as well, really not accepted or trusted by a lot of people because, uh, in fact, feared by some people because he at one time carried out religious persecution. I uh, believe by some local authorities to have mental health issues, has been accused of being an insurrectionist by some, accused of being a cult or sect leader by others. Everywhere he goes, he seems to cause trouble. Um, he's taught doctrines that aren't in line with the primary leadership. Uh, many, in fact, see him as a leader wannabe and not a, not a legitimate leader. And a lot of people think that he's just abrasive and he lacks, he lacks tact. And I think that if you were on that search committee, you would wonder why in the world anybody bothered even to give the resume a second look. I mean, would you hire that candidate for any position? And yet, of course, that is the resume for one of the great leaders of the early church. You can read his resume in the New Testament. Seven of the letters in the New Testament are widely that are widely accepted as authentic letters of that leader, they, they, contain, they contain this material. Be very upfront about it. The book of Acts, written some 30 years after the last of the letters that he wrote, same thing, does not paint a very good picture for this leader. Saul of Tarsus, also called Paul, Saul and Paul are both really the same name. Saul is the Hebrew name that he carries. Paul is his Greek name. And by his own words, he was a persecutor of the church. He said that he violently persecuted the church. That so zealous was he for the traditions of his ancestors that he violently persecuted the church of God. He said, I am the least among the apostles, not even worthy to be called an apostle because I violently persecuted the church of God. Fascinating person. Certainly controversial in his time. And in fact, controversial today, as a matter of fact. You can scan a shelf of books about Paul and you will find there in the last decade or so books that talk about the apostle in very different ways. Just by reading the titles, you can see that some authors think that he is the founder of Christianity or the co-founder of it along with Jesus. Uh, but other authors would say he is a usurper of the true faith that was Jesus. Very different perspectives. One book title is Paul, the Odd Apostle. Another one, strangely enough, Paul, the Apostle, colon, Antichrist, if you can imagine. 
All of these different perspectives of Paul. He is controversial today as he was in his own day. But he has a message for us. And so we want to spend time with Paul this fall. Uh, he has a message that we can hear and we can make a part of our own living in our own lives. I believe he has something important for us to say and we ought to understand this important leader in the earliest church. When we first meet Saul, Saul is at the stoning of a follower of the way the earliest Christians were not called Christians at all. They were called people of the way or people belonging to the way. And so this person of the way named Stephen, because of his faith, had been one of the victims, was one of the victims of Saul of Tarsus. Saul stood by the people who actually threw the stones, who stoned Stephen to death laid their coats at Saul's feet, and Saul watched the whole thing. We then see that Saul is still about his terrible business of persecuting the church when he's on his way to Damascus. And he's on his way to Damascus to do what he has been doing, and that is to arrest and to drag back in chains those found in the synagogues who are also followers of the way. And that's when he has something dramatic happen to him. The Coral Union sang beautifully and hauntingly of that experience of Saul of Tarsus. He's on the road to Damascus. He's about this terrible business when he is struck by a light and the light knocks him down and he's blinded by it. And a voice says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He asks. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Get up and go into the city and I will tell you what to do. Well, he can't get up by himself. He can't get there by himself. He has to be taken. He has to be carried there by his companions. This is significant in Saul's life. This is a kind of warning, a kind of wake-up call for him. He has been zealous for the traditions of his ancestors. And he has been doing what he believed to be the very will of God. And now he's struck down by this light and he's blinded. Wake-up calls come to us sometimes, don't they? Those times when something needs to get our attention. Something that says, you know, you may not be headed in the right direction. Things may, be, may not be going as they should be going. Maybe you're not engaged in what you need to be engaged in. It's like a warning light on the dashboard of a car that goes off. It says something is not right. Yesterday I had a friend uh, call me, a f longtime friend, I haven't talked to him in a while. He called and we were chatting and it reminded me in talking to him of a story he told me years ago. His brother was flying on a small commuter plane. It was back in the day before cockpit doors uh, on small planes like that and uh, there was just a curtain and the curtain was open the whole time and, and uh, so he could see the whole cockpit and he could see out the front of the plane and they're flying along, everything's fine until a buzzer and a red light goes off in the cockpit. Well, he was near panic, wondering what the pilot would do. And what did the pilot do? The pilot reached up on top of the instrument panel and went <laughs> and the buzzer stopped and the red light went off <laughs> and he hardly put his weight down in the plane the rest of the flight. Is that any way to respond to a warning light? And yet I think Paul sort of responded that way. I think the first warning that Paul really had, the first wake-up call for Paul, was when Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, stood there and watched Stephen die for his faith and heard him pray, Father, forgive them, just as Jesus had done on the cross. Can you imagine? <clears throat> we don't really know what Saul's 
hatred of the way came from, but we think we think we might have a good idea. He never says, the book of Acts never says. But he was zealous for the traditions of his ancestors. And perhaps it was the very thing that Saul would later, as he became widely known as Paul, his Greek name, he would, he would later proclaim. And that is this radical inclusiveness in the covenant. That all people, God's grace is big enough for everybody. Uh, that, that even males in the faith did not have to be circumcised and, and no one had to follow the purity laws because everybody is welcome into the covenant, Gentiles and Jews alike. Paul was deeply offended by that idea. And he wanted, as he said, to destroy the people of the way. I think when he saw Stephen die, that was a moment when he should have paid attention. Something's not right. Something is wrong with the way he is proceeding. Something about this doesn't sound like God at all, but he was like the pilot and he somehow made it go away. But then comes the Damascus Road, much harder to ignore knocked down to his knees, blinded. Saul, whose name is the same as the first king of Israel, the great and mighty Saul. Saul, whose name fit him very well, a larger than life personality, a man who believed that while he might not always be right, he was never wrong. One who was sure that he was doing the work of God when he persecuted the people of the way. One who was, who had a strong personality, Saul. Then he's knocked to his knees, he's blinded. He's dependent all of a sudden, not de independent. He's weak and not strong and he has to be taken by his companions to the house of Judas on a street called Straight in the city because he can't get there on his own. And it's after this experience that he bears the name Paul, his Greek name. That becomes his name the rest of the time in the book of Acts. That's how he's known. And it's interesting, Saul means something like inquirer of God. But the word Paul in the Greek means small, humble. Interesting. It's one of those name changes in Scripture that says something about the difference. Now, it's true. You read, you read Paul's letters and you realize Paul is still kind of larger than life. And Paul is still, you know, may not always be right but never wrong. He still has that kind of personality. But the difference is he's dependent on Christ. That's the difference. The difference is that he has made a 180, that suddenly he sees that God's grace is big enough for everybody and he's out there telling everyone who will listen that the grace of God is big enough to encompass all, that all are welcome into this relationship, this covenant with God. He is proclaiming the faith of and the faith in Jesus Christ. But I think I think that experience for Saul, for Paul, is really just the first step. It's an important step. It got his attention. That, that experience on the road to Damascus made him humble, put him in a frame of mind to listen and to think. He couldn't see, couldn't eat. He spent his time praying in the house of Judas, trying to sort out what's going on and what the direction of his life is and what is all of this about and what has he been doing as a zealous persecutor. And then a man named Ananias, who's also praying, has a vision. And the vision is that he is to go to a street called Straight to the house of a man named Judas and there he would find a man named Saul of Tarsus. 
And as soon as that part of the vision comes, Ananias does what we often do. He says, I don't think so. I, are you sure? I mean, Lord, do you know who Saul of Tarsus is? Have you been paying attention? He's wreaked havoc in the church. He has done horrible things. And you want me to go and to reveal that I am of the way to that man? But the Lord's pretty insistent. And Ananias is faithful and he goes. Even though he didn't want to, he goes. And he does something really interesting and he says something really powerful. When he greets Saul, he says, Brother Saul. It seems like a small thing. But you know what I think? I think for the rest of Paul's life, he looked back on that moment when this person who had been persecuted by him, this person of the way that he was trying to destroy, called him brother. Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to open your eyes and so that you might receive the Holy Spirit. And when he placed his hands on him, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see. I really think in a sense that was the completion of his conversion experience. I, I think it was incomplete until that time. And I think it was Ananias who completed it. It kind of reminds me of when Jesus healed a blind man one time and he touched him and he healed him and then Jesus said, what do you see? And he said, well, I see people but they look like trees walking around. His vision wasn't there yet and so Jesus touched him again and this time his vision was clear. I think in a, in a way that expresses what, what Saul experienced. I think he was halfway there, part of the way there. But I think what got him the rest of the way there, what really converted him, what made him understand the expansive grace of God in all of its fullness, was this man, Ananias, who said, you're my brother, Brother Saul. I'm challenged by Ananias. Years ago, Barbara Brokoff preached a sermon that I still remember. Barbara said that when she was a child, they were very poor. Didn't have money for clothes, really, for new clothes. She needed new clothes. Didn't have money for shoes, and she had shoes that were worn through, cardboard in the soles. And her mother scraped together enough egg money to, to finally give her the money to buy a cheap pair of shoes. And she had enough material to make her a new dress. And so with that dress and with those shoes, she went to church. She went to church to find people of the way. People of the way. But she recounted, she encountered a woman who was not of the way, but in the way. In the way. Because when she came into the sanctuary of that little church, she was greeted by this woman who looked at her shoes and said, you're wearing red shoes to church. Red is a harlot's color. It makes you a Jezebel, she said. She didn't even know what a Jezebel was. Or a harlot for that matter. But she knew it wasn't good. She was in the way, not of the way. She recounted how fortunately that was not her only encounter. There were people of the way 
many more people of the way in that church, and they showed her the way, and it changed her life. But that person in the way could have ended it all right there were it not for the people of the way. Her challenging question in that sermon I remember so well, are you of the way or in the way? Are you of the way or are you in the way, standing in the way of those who would experience the grace and love of God and the acceptance that Jesus offered and that Paul preached and that he experienced and that we are to offer? That's the way. Are you of the way or in the way? I think it's a challenging question for us, whether we're here or whether we're at work or whether we're at play or wherever we are. Do people experience the expansive grace and love of God from us or don't they? You know, unfortunately, these days, there are an awful lot of people who look at the church, who look at Christians and think that we're a bunch of people in the way. I mean, you, you know that. You hear about that. Folks who think that we're bigoted or that we're unaccepting or judgmental, unloving, unkind, you name it. Because unfortunately, they've probably encountered some people in the way of God's grace. We're called to be people of the way. And as we go from this place, we go as people of the way to be God's people in the world so that we too can be those who communicate the expansive grace of God. May that be who we are. People of the way. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving God, we find it challenging, wondering if we would be like Ananias and go to a place we don't want to go to talk to somebody that we're afraid of or don't want to talk to in order to extend your grace and your love. Oh God, help us to be people of the way. Never people in the way. Amen.